Hello and welcome to the to this uh, public lecture organized by the Science Institute for the Theory of Computing. Uh, my name is Peter Bartlett, I'm the Associate Director. Um, the Science Institute's the leading venue for uh, collaborative research in theoretical computer science. Uh, it brings together uh, researchers, top researchers and the next generation of outstanding um, uh, young scholars to explore deep unsolved problems about the nature and limits of computation. Uh, the Institute's core activities revolve around semester long research programs on specific topics in the foundations of computing and related fields. Uh, and this semester, although we're operating online only so far, um, we have two very active programs, one on probability geometry and computation in high dimensions and one on the theory of reinforcement learning. Um, the Institute's recently set up a new uh, law and society fellowship that's designed to enhance Institute programs that address technologies um, with impacts on human society uh, with implications for, for ethics, law and, and policy. And this fellowship is aimed at researchers who are focused on uh, the broader societal implications of the techniques and the technologies that are addressed, uh, are addressed in our programs. Uh, and we're delighted to welcome our first Law and Society Fellow, Tom Gilbert. Tom's a PhD candidate in, the, in uh, machine ethics and epistemology at UC Berkeley. Uh, his background's in philosophy, sociology and political theory. He has uh, an MPhil in uh, political thought and intellectual history from Cambridge University. Uh, and his work focuses on the ethical and political consequences of us using machine learning in organizational decision making uh, and implications for the design of AI systems that are fair, safe and accountable. Uh, he's participating in this semester's program on the theory of reinforcement learning and his talk today is titled Hard Choices in Artificial Intelligence. Welcome Tom. Thanks Peter. Uh, it's a pleasure to be giving this talk, uh, which is, I should say, based off of uh, collaborative work with members of my, my main affiliation on campus, uh, prior to Simon's, which was the uh, Center for Human Compatible AI, uh, Stuart Russell's lab, um, as well as uh, a graduate student in the IEOR department. Um, so I'll just go ahead and jump in here. Uh, and I, I wanted to start off by kind of framing what I'm going to say in the talk in relation to a lot of the themes that emerged from the boot camp um, last week, which I would describe as not simply technical problems, but also philosophical in nature, which is, um, you know, this more ambitious conceptual landscape of asking, you know, should we conceive of HRI as studying under actually dynamical systems? And that's what human relationships are, in fact, are under actually dynamical systems uh, that in principle could be modeled formally. Um, we have interesting questions with covariate shift where the notion of uh, modeling and learning rewards at training time uh, might be fundamentally different or not correlated at deployment time. Uh, we have interesting, we saw interesting questions in these, in the talks that were given about counterfactual reasoning about how to compare uh, RL policies and RL optimization versus the business as usual equivalent in a human case. Uh, for medical interventions, for example, like what should a doctor do versus what would the RL policy recommend for a certain line of treatment? And then finally, this like kind of deep ontological question of like, how do we import uh, environmental principles, whether those are from physics, whether they're from transportation, whether they're from medicine, uh, and interpret them such that we can specify the system uh, through constraints? Uh, and does that require domain expertise? Does it require certain kinds of formal assumptions? What is the boundary line there? And I, I was reminded through many of these talks of, of what I wanted to say, uh, which, which broadly, just, just to kind of make this concrete, I mean, when we encounter questions with an automated vehicle and we ask, you know, how many parameters uh, does it take uh, to make a simulation robust to reality, which is to say, how do we make sure the AB is safe if we just train it in simulation rather than if we use a real world vehicle and make it drive actual miles in the real world? How do we compare simulation versus the world in that sense through parameterization? And the, the kind of TLDR for this talk is that I think there are reasonable answers to that question, but that they are not strictly formal. And that kind of abstract line uh, between answers to that that are reasonable, which is to say recognizable to the people who will be affected by these systems, the actual stakeholders, the domain experts who are most familiar with regulatory policy um, is, is a landscape that I'm going to characterize in terms of vagueness. Uh, so this is a, 
a technical kind of philosophical concept. It's an ancient concept um, that as I've continued through my PhD work, I have found to be increasingly not, not just relevant, but really constitutive of this emerging discipline of machine ethics, uh, AI governance, AI safety, and, and for a lot of how I think about issues in RL. So for the rest of the talk, I'll basically be expositing this concept through as many concrete examples as I can think of. And I should say for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define vagueness as the practical absence of conceptual boundaries when you are attempting to develop an AI system for a given domain. Uh, which is to say, it's kind of a generalized version of the problem of misspecification, which is something that people in AI safety worry extensively about. It's increasingly become a problem in RL, uh, especially multi-agent RL, whether that's with humans or just other AI agents. Um, and so in a sense, what I'm saying in this talk is misspecification has a very long, very rich uh, intellectual history behind it. And it really falls under this notion of vagueness. So again, just, just to kind of set up the, the gestalt shift that I'm trying to make here, um, a lot of public discussions of automated vehicles and, and just machine ethics more broadly, uh, and I should say a lot of, I think, technical work as well in this, in this domain of value alignment, I think still is inclined to think of the ethical dilemmas of developing AI in terms of trolley problems, which you know, I think we're all familiar with at this point. Uh, the classic question of should I divert the trolley or the vehicle in this case to uh, intentionally harm one person or fewer people uh, for the sake of saving a larger number or should I not do that? And often the kind of legacy of this is tied to uh, you know, some version of pitting Kantian ethics against utilitarianism. And I think what's significant here is that this thought experiment, which has its own long history, assumes deterministic dynamics. It assumes a discrete action space. It assumes complete control over, in this case, the agent, as well as the environment, uh, in terms of completely and exhaustively well-defined objects. And I think this is quite limited. And I think it doesn't do a good job of capturing the reality of the choices that are faced by developers when they're dealing with actual systems. Um, and I think, it's, it, I think it's frankly kind of missing the point. And to illuminate a, a kind of even longer history here, uh, this notion of the Sorites paradox, I think is, is much more fecund for, for us just as a starting point here. So the idea behind this alternative thought experiment is if I show you uh, a pile of grains of sand and I ask you, you know, how many more grains of sand would I have to add to this uh, pile uh, before it would become a heap. So if you think of this notion of heapness, the, the thought experiment is how many grains of sand does it take to constitute a heap? Uh, this goes back to ancient Greece. So this is thousands of years old. Uh, and there were many different canonical answers to this question uh, in terms of whether you think there is an objective answer, uh, but we maybe don't know it, uh, or there are various degrees of confidence in what we think it is. You could argue that different kinds of people could legitimately answer the question differently because we use the term heap differently. Or you could argue that there's no answer. You could argue that it's, it might be semantically meaningless to try to provide some ultimate, ultimate determinate answer to that question. And I think those are the canonical schools of thought. I think they're all relevant for how we should think about AI development and also like reinforcement learning in particular. Um, because of what I'm going to describe in this talk as the set of commitments that you are making to the world as you believe it to exist when you are developing a system. So to elaborate on that a little bit, when you are designing a system, uh, for example, the model-based, model-free distinction in terms of how you believe a system should be enabled to learn about the world, what kind of representation it should be able to have of it, uh, how you go about practically training it, and what forms of validation you think are appropriate, and then how you go about integrating that system into the actual environment at deployment. Uh, those map onto these canonical schools of thought with respect to how you answer the Sorites paradox. Uh, and that's, that's kind of the deep, point that I want to make in this talk, I will circle back to this with more concrete instances. I'm just giving you a taste right now. 
Um, so the, the structure of the talk, I'll give different examples of this. Uh, one with respect to this problem of causality, of, of defining counterfactual interventions that you can make with an AI system. Uh, another is this landscape of what I'll call normative indeterminacy. And finally, this notion of situated publics uh, as, as part of, I think, what, what will constitute the criterion for how these sorts of choices should be made. And for each of these, I'm gonna draw a contrast with um, a school of thought or representative that I think is at the moment widely cited or widely trusted in either the AI landscape, AI ethics landscape or RL landscape and, and set up a contrast between that approach and, and what I'll instead be proposing at a, at a philosophical level. So I'll start with causality. Uh, and in particular, the, the, the influence of Judea Pearl's uh, formalization of graphical models as a way to, to think about causality uh, in, in the context of AI systems. So uh, these five necessary steps of causal analysis are something that uh, Pearl and his students have often forwarded as a, a superior refined model of how to evaluate uh, interventions, or rather to think of causality in terms of interventions, which is basically to uh, be able to assume deterministic dynamics under conditions of uncertainty. So the idea here is, if you follow this procedure uh, through, through a specific set of tools, such as do calculus, uh, you can basically evaluate uh, whether a certain kind of causal chain makes sense or not with respect to the problem that you care about. Uh, the sequence of defining in terms of expressing the target quantity, assume, identify, estimate, and test is the sequence that Pearl basically proposes. Um, and I think what I want to really emphasize here is the steps of identification and estimation. So you have this target quantity, whatever it is you care about, whatever it is you're trying to account for, whether it's why is the grass wet, uh, you know, how, what, uh, what would it entail if I treated sepsis one way rather than some other way? Uh, you, you, you try to determine the causal chain of sequence there in terms of like what you think caused the illness, how you think the illness is going to change over time, and what a certain kind of an action would do to intervene on that sequence. And then there's this work of estimation, which is to say you, 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 you decide the conditions of uncertainty in terms of how confident you are uh, and how much information you would need in order to evaluate that sequence uh, as you've mapped it out in this, in this graphical model. And I wanna draw a contrast here with the work of David Lewis, who is uh, another philosopher uh, preceding Pearl, who has instead emphasized the way in which uh, causality and more specifically counterfactual reasoning, which is just to say, you know, why does the world work one way rather than some other way? Or what would be the likely result if I acted in a way other than the way I'm acting now? Uh, and, and Lewis was very clear and consistent in his works that the notion of a counterfactual was inherently vague. He says this in the second paragraph of his most famous book. Uh, I, I presented an illustrative quotation here uh, from an earlier paper in which he, he's sort of challenging this notion of the way in which what he calls an adequate understanding uh, would have, doesn't have to make uh, certain kind of reference to unactualized possibilities. So the example he would give something, just to make this concrete, uh, the example he gives is like, if a kangaroo didn't have a tail, could it still hop around? <laughs> His Australian influence showing there. Uh, and what Lewis meant by that was um, that that sentence is vague. And the reason it's vague is it's not clear what we mean by that. If a kangaroo didn't have a tail, could it still hop around? Does that mean that the kangaroo is an adult or a child? Does it mean that are the laws of gravity still the same? Are we still in Australia? Uh, is this a Martian colony where we've somehow replicated the climatological conditions of Australia, but the gravity is different, such that the kangaroo might still be able to get away with hopping or not? And the point is the, the sentence, if the kangaroo didn't have a tail, could it still hop, isn't doing that work for us. It's not specifying the environment in, in a, a more AI way of saying that. Uh, there's a misspecification or an underspecification at work in that sentence. And so what Lewis says is basically the game of counterfactuals is to be confident in your willingness to trade off vagueness. We still say sentences like that, and we still more or less know what they mean based off of the context of the utterance. So to corroborate what was said in one of the talks about how the way you should specify a system depends on the context in which it was specified, and the robot should understand that, 
I think Lewis actually has a pretty rich language for helping us make sense of situations like this. So this notion of what it means for a situation to be somewhat vaguely specified is the key takeaway here. So he, his work is full of diagrams like this. I apologize, this is very pixelated. Uh, basically what, what Lewis would do is illustrate some sequence or degree of possible worlds farther and farther removed from actuality, which is the world, in fact, as, we, as it is right now, as we experience it right now, for the sake of attempting to roughly formalize degrees of comparison. So like how far removed is a world where uh, a kangaroo without a tail could still technically be able to hop if it was on Mars versus a world where a kangaroo with half a tail could probably still get away with hopping if it was in, on Earth or something like this. And so what, what Lewis was trying to do was say, the language isn't completely doing the work for us, but it can come up with a counterfactual logic that will enable us to remain confident in what we think the semantic scope of those utterances is. And so I won't go into all the, the, the details of his language here. I just wanna emphasize the contrast between this approach and, and what Pearl was proposing, uh, is proposing, which is, you know, we, we need to have a language in, in AI for degrees of comparative similarity uh, that are not simply amenable to optimization or straightforward parameterization, because that entails uh, an intuitive notion of how distant we are from actuality. So how distant is a world in which AVs are common enough that that simulation would hold versus one in which AVs are like barely on the horizon in the minds of pedestrians or other drivers, but where the simulation might still work under, under very well specified conditions. This is the kind of intuition that Lewis, I think, was trying to get at in, in much of his philosophical work. And so when he talks about the vagueness of overall similarity, what he means is that specification is not simply a formal problem. It is also determined partially by consensus and convention. His dissertation work, in fact, was on convention. In fact, the example he used in that in his dissertation was uh, the main one was why it is people drive on one side of the road of one countries and on the other side of the road in others. Uh, so even his examples, I think, speak what, very directly to, to a lot of the, the kind of specific questions they aim at automated vehicle type problems. But this, this difference between specification being basically a normative problem of consensus making versus specification being a technical problem of featureization or optimization is I think very deep and very rich and something that we should be thinking about more systematically rather than treating it as downstream from modeling assumptions. Um, and I think I, I don't want to sound like a mystic here and I don't want to sound defeatist when I say this stuff. I think it is possible to do formal work that corroborates many of these intuitions that is good and that also can make sense to stakeholders. And the analogy that I would just make here is I think what Lewis is trying to get at with this, this line of reasoning is analogous to the, the distinction between real analysis and calculus, uh, which I think calculus is kind of more, more similar to, to the graphical model approach where it's a very interesting, valuable tool for specific domains that are already well specified and already amenable to algebraically determined dynamics. So you can use calculus very richly to understand Newtonian mechanics in a physical sense. Uh, but that's partly a problem of the way in which there's a very well-defined set of empirics behind observing, you know, in, in that original context, the movement of the cosmos was something we could constantly observe every night. Uh, there was a way in which the tool of calculus was very well suited to that physical domain, and it's not automatically suited to other physical domains. And so real analysis is kind of the dirty, grimy work behind calculus saying, here is why this works given certain assumptions that are reasonable in this way and not in other ways. And this is really the way in which we should think about causality and the way in which we should think of Lewis's contribution and this willingness to engage in a conversation about the degrees of comparison between possible worlds, uh, rather than just assuming that the world is already a discrete action space that we can just learn enough about to optimize over it, which I don't think is how the world works. And it's certainly not how other possible worlds work once AVs become common. To give another example of this, treating something like chickenpox using reinforcement learning is not gonna be the same thing as treating sepsis. Uh, and the reason is that chickenpox and sepsis are not the same kind of pathology. They are not just distinct diseases. 
the nature of the pathology is different. Different numbers of people are affected. The diseases are not chronic in the same way. They are not terminal in the same way. The normative stakes of the diseases cannot be compared with each other. A lot of this informal work is done through bedside manner. This is what doctors do. Okay, when they're consulting with a patient, they're making real-time decisions that are largely intuitive based off of decades or years of experience about what state of what illness this kind of a person is experiencing based off of what I can tell they're feeling. And I'm not just, in principle, we can formalize this stuff. In principle, yes, it is a specification problem. But some of the work of that specification is done by institutions. Some of that work is done by the way we educate doctors. It's not done in terms of the actual decision pipeline of like how we go about diagnosing an illness and how we map inputs onto outputs. A lot of these mechanisms are informal and the work of making them formal is normative and not strictly technical. So sorry, just, just to clear, if this wasn't clear, chicken pox is on the left, sepsis is on the right. Uh, that's, I'm not a domain expert, but that's just what those slides were. So just to sum up what I think the takeaway here, uh, what, that, that we can, to put graphical models in a kind of richer context, is that there's, there's no free lunch, okay? There's a price to using them. You have to be willing to pay some degree or some me measure of metaphysical inaccuracy in return for a determinate formulation of objects under conditions of uncertainty, which means that the value of graphical models and model-based RL, I should say by extension, is that its value is proportionate to its applicability to the situation. And you can't pretend that it's just a problem of known uncertainties. It has to also be a problem of defining worthwhile inaccuracies. And I think in order to make sense of that, you are going to have to speak in, in the medical context, you are going to have to speak to doctors, you are going to have to speak to clinicians, you are going to have to speak to nurses, because the consensus driven nature of treating certain kinds of illnesses demands a different kind of specification problem that includes formal modeling, but is not restricted to it. So I wanna move on to, that, that leads I think quite naturally into the second topic I wanted to discuss, which is this notion of normative indeterminacy. Uh, so the contrast here is that I think a lot of work at present in this landscape of machine ethics uh, or value alignment is, is often the term used in the AI safety landscape uh, and also sometimes discussed in reinforcement learning conversations that I've had is that machine ethics should be understood as a problem of normative uncertainty which is we're designing systems that are gonna be learning from us about what is the good, what is good behavior, what actions are better than others, what actions should be prohibited when and how. And so just to say that somewhat more abstractly, the question of normative uncertainty is what should be the criteria for discovering, evaluating and resolving harms among stakeholders. And a dominant position or I should just say representative position in this landscape has been put forward by William McCaskill uh, in his dissertation originally, he's expanded on it since then called metanormativism. Uh, and the idea behind metanormativism is yes, okay, there are all these norms that govern why people act as they do in certain ways. Um, and basically systems need to learn those things. So if crudely we're faced with something like a trolley problem, where I don't know, or I'm not confident in whether I should switch the route of the car to take a certain kind of an action over another, what the question behind metanormativism is, well, look, it's an empirical problem in part. What additional information would you need to aggregate in order to resolve the uncertainty? What better version of route planning? What better RL policy, okay, would you need such that the optimization could do a lot of the work for you? Uh, and I just wanna emphasize here that this position rests often like on a kind of implicit analogy between the, the uncertainty of like all the different norms that are at stake in, in a driving context, let's say, and empirical observability. The idea is that if you leverage the ability of the system to learn, it could basically do a better job or a more consistent job of following norms even than humans do. So we could optimize over not just what an actual human driver might do, but also what a transportation planner might do and what uh, a governor might do simultaneously because of its ability to observe these different dynamics at the same time. Note that the dynamics are still deterministic in this frame. Now, I, I just, again, want to hit this intuition that the part of the problem with that is that social systems as a whole can be understood as dynamical systems in which intervening on one layer, even just by observing it, affects the other layers. 
they're in, you know, pick any of these contexts we've discussed already in this boot camp, whether it's medicine, whether it's transportation, whether it's climate change, I mean, almost anything. There is some implicit hierarchy of expertise and domain trust, such that if you intervene on one part of the pyramid, you are going to reshape the other parts. Economic sociologists call this performativity. Uh, other disciplines might have other names for it. The point is that when you are observing the world, you are by definition also in a certain relationship with that world. And what your entry point is to observability, whether it's an API, whether it's some legacy database from which you can learn is not neutral because it was also created by some of these stakeholders. So there's a, a sense of responsibility to that context that I think transcends the frame of metanormativism. And so that's when I'm saying I'm expanding that definition here through reference to vagueness and saying the issue is really more this normative indeterminacy, not normative uncertainty. You can't simply discover or encode norms of behavior. You're also making them by choosing the practical conditions under which you are developing an AI system. And what that means is that developing safe AI or value aligned AI through like the crafting of rules or like what sorts of validation you trust is also about developing practices in, in, in yourself and in your relationship with whoever was previously trusted with managing that domain and translating value commitments into the formalism. And again, often this work, this work always happens. It has to, or the system's not going to work. It just usually happens behind the scenes. And I think there needs to be more honesty about that indeterminacy, such that like you're saying, like, look, I could do this more than one way. We don't have to treat this illness in any particular way. I'm choosing to do it this way because that seems legitimate. And that has to be justified. It's not pre-given. It's not something discoverable by more accurately observing the domain or the data available to you. So I'm gonna circle back to a point I made near the start of this talk about uh, these different canonical schools of thought for resolving issues of vagueness. Um, and I should say this part in particular is based off of a working paper uh, with, with two of my collaborators here, that there were basically three canonical ways of resolving patterns of indeterminacy. One is to say there is a precise boundary out there and maybe we could discover it, but we don't precisely know where it is yet. Um, and this is based, I see metanormativism as a, as a contemporary equivalent to this ancient position of epistemicism. The idea that in this case, in fact, there is some precise grains of sand that constitute a heap, but it's not at present available to us to know what that is. And it's, it's, it's an empirical question. We could, we could do some experiments. We could, we could hire some psychologists and get them to do a better job of understanding the cognitive mechanisms behind human reasoning to see where that boundary is. Another approach is semantic indeterminism, which is, this is often associated with Wittgenstein. The idea is there are multiple language communities and that they might use the word heap differently. And so we just have to accept that there is a kind of constrained, confined pluralism in, in what the answers to that question are based off of the number of language communities that in fact exist. And then finally, you could argue, no, actually there's no boundary for harm. There's no boundary for what it means to make an intervention good or bad because society is vague. It, it might be an object you don't think is even possible to define well. And so therefore you could argue we might as well replace a lot of uh, human driven medical interventions with RL policies because there's really no one to say that the system won't be just as good. Uh, and it's, it's, and we have every reason to think on the opposite, the system might be better because at least we can know deterministically how it works and you can't know that about people. So again, I wanna circle back and say, I think all of these positions are accurate. I think they're all real. I think they're all true. I think the opposition is a misnomer because what you are doing when you are developing an AI system is making commitments along each of these axes. What you are doing at design time, at training time and deployment time is making commitments within the domain of each of these positions. There is some degree to which there, there are boundaries of what norms count or what actions are okay but there's uncertainty about that. And it's possible that you can design the system in a way that it could learn more accurately what those things are. It's also true that people think of the world differently and have somewhat different semantics to make sense of it. That has to be respected. And it's also the case that some people are different from each other in such a way that has no semantic equivalent, that there is no base for comparison for it. 
And that has to be also included in how you design these systems, particularly at integration time, at, which is to say at deployment time. To make this concrete again, potholes. Most AVs at present, understandably, are developed and trained in such a way to avoid potholes. Makes sense? Why would we want them to go in potholes? It would make the roads worse. It might harm the vehicle. It might scare the passengers in the cars. Other drivers would be confused why they're doing this. Let's not go in them. The thing is potholes are not natural features of the environment. These are not things that are out there in the world before cars exist. They're only ever created by things like the systems we were designing. So what you are doing when you are building an AV is you are deciding whether we should care about the fact that potholes exist. The more common AVs become, the more pressing that normative question becomes. If we decide that the most important thing for AVs to do is avoid potholes, potholes will become more common. Public investment in roads will be compromised. The nature of what it means to drive and be a passenger will be different. I know that sounds weird. I'm not saying we should deliberately program the vehicles to be willing to go into potholes. What I'm saying is the thresholds for how the cars engage in route planning needs to be justified partially by the normative context of what roads are for. There needs to be a tighter coordination between route planning as an optimization problem and public policy planning. Another example is jaywalking. If we make cars robust to not hit people, but only worry about certain ways of hitting people because we consider them to be most likely, we are effectively deciding how we want society to wrap around AVs in a way that we didn't have to. What it means to jaywalk people is to make certain kinds of human behavior stigmatized or disincentivized because the dominant mode of transportation would be compromised unless that thing is put into a second tier or third tier position. This is a kind of danger that I think AV people often just don't think about because the goal is to make the car safe no matter what. They should be safe no matter what. The point is safety is indeterminate. We, you know, 30,000 people die every year right now from cars. That, that's, that's just been a reality we've been willing to accept. Maybe we shouldn't accept that world. Maybe we should aim for something better. But the point is part of the reason we're willing to live with that is that we don't like how much control there would have to be in order for that rate of death to be reduced. And the point is that if you don't want people to be made into jaywalkers, you have to give them a seat at the table. You have to be willing to say, where should pedestrians be permitted to walk in a way that they would accept as legitimate, rather than just making the cars drive so conservatively that we basically make the burden of responsibility fall on people to understand the cars as driving differently than human drivers rather than the other way around. I'll, I'll circle back to this a bit more later in the talk. And then finally, I want to briefly give this example of uh, what's, what's been called moral crumple zones uh, coming out of work uh, by uh, Madeline Ellish, I believe is her name, uh, which, which basically is this interesting point that it's, it's often been the case that when AVs crash or when they harm people or even when they hit a pedestrian, uh, the humans are blamed. Whether it's the pedestrian, whether it's the person who is nominally behind the wheel, uh, who own the vehicle, or whether it's like the local regulatory infrastructure, because they, as, as was said, did not sufficiently understand what to expect from the system. And this question of like where the burden of responsibility lies is not something that I, that I really see addressed in much formal work right now, but it needs to be. Because otherwise, again, we're going to live in a world where the systems are trivially safe, but we implicitly begin to think of people as less safe in and of themselves, because we're cognitively limited, we're more engaged in habit than we are in like active awareness of what we can expect from these cars at all times. And so this, this work of defining what we should reasonably expect people to engage in when they are engaging with these vehicles should be part of the way we specify these models. Because if we don't, and we just let model specification do all the work, we effectively let those systems decide the way transportation should operate and make anybody who doesn't get that bear, bear the cost, either legally or, or financially in, in some, other, some other informal way. So what this, what this climax is in, this again is drawing from this paper I've written with my collaborators, 
is this hard choices and in artificial intelligence framework where these different sources of indeterminacy in a given AI pipeline are all relevant and have to be respected. And those choices need to be made explicit about the fact that we could have specified the system differently. It's indeterminate how we should have done so. Here is our reasoning for why we're doing it. And allowing a kind of dissent to be integrated into the pipeline such that other stakeholders at least have the ability to contest those assumptions. And if that work isn't done, again, you will end up with a system that's optimal according to its own specification, trivially, but it will be misaligned. In, in any meaningful way from the world that we want it to be optimal against. So I, I'm happy to engage in, with people in conversation about you know, how this framework works, what I mean by these different, these different terms here. I just wanna communicate the high level intuition in, in this talk. And then finally, I wanna end with this concept of situated publics, which is um, a follow-up paper that I'm now writing with one of my collaborators on this original paper. Um, which I think provides a kind of uh, a lens for thinking about this, this work as making these hard choices as, as partly political and, and, not, and not simply a matter of analytic reasoning or of, of personal ethics, that, this, that you are engaging in, in genuinely difficult choices with other stakeholders who might disagree with you, and that needs to be acknowledged. So this is now where I'm going to introduce um, you know, my, my lab at Berkeley, the Center of Human Compatible AI, uh, as I said before, this is uh, a lab led by Stuart Russell. The goal of CHI, as we call it affectionately, uh, is to build provably beneficial systems, uh, which is to say, you know, systems that are value aligned, systems that we know or have reason to think will follow human intentions. And CHI, you know, engages deeply with this, this work on normative, un normative uncertainty uh, that, I, that I mentioned before, mostly from a technical standpoint rather than a philosophical one. And what I've been doing uh, for about four years now is, you know, uh, hanging out there and helping them think about this, uh, you know, not simply technical, but also more socio-technical and, and political landscape of, of what it means to design a safe system. Uh, this slide is just to kind of give a taste of the kind of field work that I've been doing, uh, which includes, you know, several years of participant observation, interviews, uh, many, many, you know, productive collaborations and conversations with members of that lab and also adjacent research institutes. And I, I just want to provide that as a frame to sort of say, like, to, to kind of stick the landing in terms of like how I think these issues with normative uncertainty are relevant to AI safety as a whole and not, and not merely to how we should think about something like ABs. Um, and so Chai kind of in, in the past and its work has kind of had this distinctive approach to how we should resolve these, these problems that I've been discussing, which is that we should assign roles, uh, distinctive roles to humans and machines uh, that make it possible for systems to, to do what we actually want them to do. So this could be human robot interaction uh, as, a, as a field. It could be something even more specific like inverse reinforcement learning uh, or cooperative IRL is, is the particular paper I'm thinking of right now. Uh, this is what that means is basically that uh, the human has a pedagogic stance. The human is teaching the robot how to do an activity. The robot observes, the agent observes, and it observes enough times with enough assumptions that it is then able eventually to autonomously perform the activity at a high level. Um, that doesn't resolve this issue of trust, as Chai knows. Um, humans can't always be trusted to be good, be good pedagogues, be good teachers. Uh, we're often, recent work has found we're better uh, when we're ignorant and we don't even know we're trying to teach the robot, we're just engaging in the activity naturally, uh, which raises like what we should do when humans who are nominally good at the activity can't actually be trusted to play the role well. So to give, you know, some examples of this, um, again, the way Chai approaches this is that there, there are certain like delineable challenges in, in a robot's life, such as like figuring out what to optimize optimizing it in an environment with others and delineating all the different sorts of roles that are at stake, not just the user, but also, also the robot designer. And one example of like the way this is often like framed, and I mean, Anka talked about this as well, is if you imagine the, the red car here is an automated vehicle and it's trying to merge into the left lane, which at present has a human driver, uh, the robot might do something like the following, uh, which is if it's trying to figure, if it, let's assume it doesn't know you know, what the human is likely to do if it takes, if the, if the car motions to merge into that lane. 
So what it might do is it could start to merge in a deliberately aggressive fashion uh, in a way that you know, it would signal you know, briefly and then just immediately start to go into the lane. And particularly like with the intent of observing what, how the human will respond to that action. If the human uh, slows down, uh, the, the AV might take that as an indication that, okay, it's safe for me to continue and it'll complete the merger. Uh, and what it'll implicitly be doing is like updating its model of the human as a as basically a passive driver, as someone who's like not going to challenge the AV or might not, or yeah, otherwise just is not something to be concerned about and not going to impede the merger. If the human, however, does not notice or aggressively speeds up or something similar, the AV might take that as an indication of like, okay, whoa, I need to back off here. I need to stay in my original lane. Um, and this, this is a way of conceiving of like, okay, so that's, was that safe? Um, and, and I give this as an example again of like, okay, yes, that, that's safe as illustrated, but effectively what you were doing, if all we do is, is constrain the problem to these parameters, is choosing the kinds of drivers that uh, the car is going to work with and the kinds that it won't. So if you trace this out to a world in which AVs comprise most vehicles uh, or some like large minority of vehicles, um, we are going to have to change the way humans take driver's exams because there is no way we are going to let most humans continue to drive cars if AVs are doing this on a regular basis. Uh, there is no way we're going to let most pedestrians continue to act as natural pedestrians in a world where AVs are constantly nudging to find marginal boundaries based off of what kind of model of that person they think would be safe under certain regimes of expectation. Um, the model works as specified, but you are changing the semantics of driving, the semantics of the road are at stake when you're engaging in work like this. So if you look at the way like actual AV pipelines are structured to illustrate some of these indeterminacies I was describing abstractly before, trade-offs between perception and rooting like happen and they are significant. And they're often again, like informal because these teams are distinct at the way these in the way of many of these companies are set up. A lot of the work that goes into localization, into routing, into prediction, into planning, rest on distinct kinds of choices that need to be better coordinated with respect to what different kinds of stakeholders would see as legitimate. You can trivially find some optimization across all these different arrows that is internally going to be consistent and is going to not kill people. But that's not all that we mean when we talk about AVs being safe. In fact, I don't think it's very much of what we mean when we speak of AVs being safe. Most people, surveys at present say most people still are not gonna to wanna to ride in these things. And the reason is that at present, there's still really no equivalent anywhere near the level of like sophistication behind this like decades long process of certification that has been enforced by the Department of Transportation, uh, FHWA, uh, NHTSA, organizations that have extremely well specified metrics corroborated human factors, corroborated in driving scenarios, corroborated in crash testing, to show exactly what the boundaries between different kinds of safety are. Uh, I can say a lot more about this, but I'm running out of time. Uh, but the point is like, we, we need to get better at defining these normative regimes, these normative boundaries against which different kinds of safety, first of all, make sense. And secondly, are understood to be either a matter of like the physical parameters of the car, or the cognitive parameters of the driver or the physical parameters of the road. And the thing is right now, we sort of expect AVs to like inherit all of those things in, in a way that we can just sort of optimize over rather than understanding maybe that delineation is out of date and that's interesting, but there needs to be a delineation. There need to be specified roles that corroborate not just the relationship between the robot designer and the user, but also the robot designer the city planner, the, the, the person who updates signage on stop signs and paves over asphalt, different sorts of pedestrians, all of these people need to have a seat at the table. Exactly what that looks like, I don't know. But that's the kind of normative coordination we're going to need uh, in order to resolve this. And I, I think this quote from Andrew Ng is illustrative of the danger here. Uh, in my interviews with, with many regulators, I bring this up, he, he said this, um, as an example, say rather than building AI to solve the pogo stick problem, we should partner with the government to ask people to be lawful and considerate. Safety isn't just about the quality of the AI technology. 
Um, and again, this is what I mean when I say safety is indeterminate. It's a matter of responsibility and it's a matter of commitment. The question is not how do we get cars to not do damage? The question is what counts as damage? That there is no boundary for that at present or the boundaries are very roughly fixed. And we need to decide if those are the boundaries we want and if they are, whose responsibility is it to maintain them? Is it the public's responsibility to make AV safe by expecting less of them? That's the kind of vision that I think is at stake in this quote, is whether AVs are inevitable and whether in response to that, we should basically accept that roads are just gonna change in ways that we can't control. Maybe that's the future, maybe it's not. I mean, this is the sort of conversation that I think we should be having at a technical level, as well as on a political level. So what I'm doing right now uh, with my collaborator, I just wanna illustrate this very briefly, is, in, is uh, incorporating this notion of situated publics into how we should do the parameterization behind rooting. So what this model, this is sort of influenced by work by John Dewey uh, a long time ago and James Gronig more recently, who's a, a, a kind of a public relations expert, is that you, you think about parameterization not just as model optimization, but as the, the, the relationship between the most affected stakeholders and the designer, it would, which could be the AV designer in this case, and that there is a zone of comparability of expectation in which both groups have their interests being met. Their, their commitments are both being corroborated and that zone might be roughly fixed, but it could still be fixed. So the trade-off between perception and rooting, for example, in an AV, we want that to fall in the win-win zone. We don't want it to arbitrarily follow in one on this diagram of pure asymmetry where the AV company says, look, the cars are safe as specified. You just should have not been in that intersection at that time or not been on your smartphone or you know, not, not jaywalking in this way. And, and, that, and so it's really your fault. That's, that's, the, that's the main parameterization bottleneck in my mind. It's not so much whether in simulation you can get these things to be safe. It's can you get a critical threshold of stakeholders to understand what the system is going to do and to accept it as, and not just accept it, but affirm their own interests. Um, so I'm writing this right now. This is sort of more setting an agenda than it is presenting a final solution. Um, but, but those are now the three, I've covered now the three things I wanted to say. So to put it all together, I kind of have this final slide of what the takeaways are here. I think that there needs to be more work done on identifying the relevant domain indeterminacies and defining their relationship according to roughly fixed parameters. Uh, and that that work is going to partially be technical, it is also going to entail a reform in how the institutions themselves are going to operate, where doctors work, how we update the signage on roads, how we go about deciding what the world is going to be in which these agents can be optimal. And I think that's going to be a, a very large undertaking about controlling, defining, and democratizing uh, the features of defining the features of safety critical systems as a natural extension of technical work. So um, I, I have a lot more thoughts on this and there are a lot more case studies we could consider, uh, but, but I'll stop there and, and hopefully we still have some time for questions. So, so thank you for this opportunity. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, that was fascinating. We do have uh, a few minutes for questions. Uh, there's actually uh, one question in the Q&A, so feel free to add them there if you want. If you are in, um, in this panelist category, feel free to turn on your uh, video, unmute yourself and, and, and ask a question. Uh, so um, in the, in the Q&A, Irina asks, apologies if you already mentioned this and I missed it, but did you address the impact of adversarial efforts and data poisoning on optimization? Yeah, I think that so, okay, so as far as, um, I guess I touched on this briefly, not in those terms with respect to like adversarial learning, I think is a very fecund like domain. And I think that, I mean, the, the example I always go to in my head, I mean, when I think about it is, yeah, I mean, you know, you stick a piece of gum on a stop sign and the neural net classifies it as a giraffe, you know, rather than a stop sign. Okay, that's bad. Um, we, we, should, we should use adversarial learning, so that's not true. It's not a panacea. And the reason is a determinacy. You cannot adversarially learn all your way to understanding what a stop sign is. I wish you could. The reason is that stop signs are not natural features of the environment. 
for the, for the first years cars existed, there were no stop signs. Okay, were the cars safe? I mean, astonishingly somewhat, yeah, they were. And the reason is that everyone knew there weren't stop signs. So when people entered into situations where they had to be careful, they were careful. There was no discrete decision heuristic by which people like always programmatically stopped, looked around at a four-way stop and then moved ahead. That scheme is already a specification of the environment. And it entailed a larger discussion about updating windshields to make them large enough that you could see things like stop signs, what color stop signs should be. Like, this is not new. A lot of these problems are not new. It's just that the, the, the learning environment is new because we now have new tools at our disposal. So what that implies is there's a certain threshold that I don't think we've discovered yet where we can get these cars good enough so they don't misclassify stop signs with guns stuck on them, but they still can't see every stop sign. And we need to decide at that point whether that means that stop signs themselves should be rebuilt in such a way that the neural nets can perform adequately, or whether there are certain kinds of roads where they shouldn't be allowed on, because for whatever reason, the stop signs are grimier or there's something wrong with their ability to reliably recognize the signage. There are people whose job it is to do signage. <laughs> we should be talking to those people. We should either be paying them more or hire more of them. Uh, and it, it really just rests on this question of whether you think that the cars are built for the road or the roads are built for the cars. My concern is that we're going to end up in a place where so many resources are poured into adversarial learning that we just sort of make the roads conform to the model specification. The entire point of a model is to, be con is to conform to the world. That's the work that we should be doing. It's hard work. It is partly technical, but it's predominantly socio-technical. I probably said enough. <laughs> yeah, um, no, that's great. So uh, there's a, a question from Manuel uh, in, in the chat now uh, about the reception we've seen. So, so, so much of AI ethics among computer scientists seems to stay on discussions of technical fixes or in abstracted situations like the trolley problem instead of these deep socio-technical questions that engage with normative philosophical questions about epistemology and metaphysics and such. How does this work seem received and or internalized in CS and AI circles as opposed to say STS? Yeah, okay, that's a great question. Um, that's a great question. I mean, a lot of this talk was my own result from asking myself that question. So, uh, so I, I, I'm not comfortable portraying myself as an authority on these communities, um, although I've published in both and, and collaborated with members in both. My impression is that there is a lot of mistrust from the STS community about uh, the, the, the dominant perspectives in machine ethics and value alignment. Um, now, there are a lot of reasons for that mistrust. Uh, but I think it can be summed up in, yeah, this, this difference between whether you think um, the world is a discrete action space or not. In a sense, the entire point of STS is to say that it's not. The world is fluid, it is dynamic, it is continuous. You can discretize the world, okay? You can define action spaces uh, within it. You can make an environment in which a system like this can learn. But the work of doing that remakes the world. It is no longer the same domain. It is no longer going to follow the same norms. It is no longer going to have the same semantics. Um, and I think at present, the STS community is so anxious about that basic fact that they are inclined to, to, to distrust a lot of the work that's being done in machine ethics. My approach is pragmatic, which is to say, this is an opportunity to refashion the norms by which we want certain domains to work. Um, I don't think cars are aligned with humans right now. I don't think they've been aligned ever. And I think, you know, it distresses me that we accept it as a price, as the price of political economy, that tens of thousands of people die every year just because of the convenience of what these cars provide. I don't think that's an aligned system. I, I recognize that's my ethics talking. Uh, but what I want is more honesty and I, I, and I should really say more, more humility from both sides in the sense that, uh, 
uh, Technics remake the world. And there is a, and a kind of agency there, uh, normatively speaking, that I think the STS community should, should learn from. And that the machine ethics community should maybe be more humble in relation to, and, and not just think that, that creating a research design of simulation is gonna make your system um, you know, optimal enough that it should be deployed at scale. I'll stop there. I, I'm saying too much. So we're actually out of time. You have a, a bunch more questions there. Um, uh, they do get saved. You'll have a, a chance to see them all, but unfortunately okay. not address them here. Um, fascinating area, hugely important. And, and that was a really, really uh, amazing talk. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks, Peter. Um, and just to advertise, we we have another we have a science communicator in residence talk at the same time next week. So, um, hope to see you all for that. Thanks again, Tom.